Hi, this is Mitchell Sigmund from Acoustica, and I'm here today with Glenn Phillips, lead vocalist and guitarist of Toad the Wet Sprocket. And we're going to talk about Glenn's music with Toad the Wet Sprocket and his new solo release, Swallowed by the New, and uh, recording and making music and whatever else comes up. So, Glenn, how you doing? <laughs> Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you. How do you think recording music has changed since the 90s when Toad the Wet Sprocket rose to fame? Uh, I mean... Completely, yet not at all. Uh, I, I mean, we were back in the days of, you know, two-inch tape, and if you wanted to edit something, you had to, you know, get a razor blade and cut the tape, right? So, um, I mean, we're not in the era of edit blocks anymore, but I also feel like uh, new technology just kind of gives you an ability to make choices about how you're going to do it. I spend, I, I have a habit of making manifestos before I record. Um, and I was always really into like, there's this period of Joe Jackson records where he was doing all these experiments, whether it was, you know, like big world was a live live band in front of an audience, but with no audience noise, right. Recorded and mixed directly to two track, like a, like a studio album, but recorded in front of an audience. Uh, Mike's murder, I think was, or, was it called Mike's Murder? But it was like mostly two mics for the whole, it was just like a stereo mic in a room, tiny bit of spot miking. Like he was doing, I call it manifesto recording, where you like state what your rules are. And I think doing that in digital recording is really good. Just, I mean, it's similar to like Georgie O'Keeffe's Blue Period. You give yourself some limitations and that enables you to be more creative, but within a certain amount of boundaries, instead of being able to kind of massage and fix it. Do you think that's kind of more of a necessity these days? Because digital gives you such an unlimited palette and unlimited rules, whereas in the analog days, those rules were kind of made for you, just dictated by the environment. That kind of yeah. Thing. And I don't think those rules are better or worse. I mean, I think just deciding where your boundaries are. I mean, for me, it enables me to... Um, not lose, I, I can get like really OCD. And so I need something, whether it's just a producer or if not a producer, a manifesto to kind of force me to stop at a certain point and declare when things are done. Do you also think it, it helps to, uh, to focus a recording? Cause I, some people, some people just have a sound and a style and they're going to have that sound and style no matter what, but other people I find uh, myself included, will end up doing 14 different kinds of music in six different ways without a set of rules. It, it, w that set mm -hmm. of rules tends to focus you more in and make more of a, a solid, you know, a, a unified work, I guess is what I'm saying. I guess, and it depends on how often you record or how many outlets you have. Like, I have different outlets. Uh, you know, I've got my total nerdy, like, there's a project we've only done one album but you know it's called remote tree children and it was a friend of mine like it's top to bottom the nerdiest thing i've ever done and it's a ton of fun and then i'll do you know i did a solo album a couple of years ago that was just an experiment there was one band and one stereo ribbon mic in the middle of a room and we mixed it by moving people around the room you know so <laughs> uh it was completely air mixed everything straight to two tracks and I could edit between takes, but you know, there was no click, uh, no mixing. It was just, I was right in front of the mic and we would move everybody around the room. So I like going to those extremes. Do you have, uh, do you have a set of parameters and I suppose like you could call it a manifesto when you're working with Toad the Wet Sprocket, do you say, okay, these are these people and these are the parameters we work within and then we make this kind of music or do you try to change it up? For me, with Toad, it's more about composition. Uh, I mean, the first two Toad albums we just recorded live. First one was done in a you know in Thousand Oaks on a sixteen track amp you know Ampex through flicking your console in a track tone, right? So we just played it and then we mixed it, and uh, it was like forty eight hours to record and mix the whole album. So that was where we came from. And then when we got to go to a big studio for the fear album, you know, we were, we synced up, we had 48 tracks, you know, and an SSL. And we're going to use them all. <laughs> we used them all. And I mean, but it was the more arduous process, you know, and then we kind of pulled it back for later records. But, uh, when, when Toad got back together, you know, it was pro tools and, uh, 
we'd never recorded that way as a band. And uh, everybody was, I think the thing about going back to Toad for me doing New Constellation was, you know, it had been a 16 year gap. And so it was more about writing and making decisions, getting to ask myself, what was a Toad song? What was a solo song? What was a song to save for other projects? And uh, when I was writing, writing with the anticipation of having a backup band, right? Like when I write solo, I don't do a lot of counter melody because there's no one else to sing those parts. And when it's Toad, I know there's three voices there. So I could write kind of... You know, you know, the DNA know, of the song could include a drummer and could include this energy and could include counter melody. So it's more in, in that realm that it shifts. So do you, do you find yourself leaving space for them to contribute or do you actually try to compose with, with the other guys in mind? Um, I mean, it's, it's always been different with Toad, like where I'll have an idea, but everybody's going to come up. I mean, Todd writes these amazing guitar parts, so I would demo stuff up and just assume all my parts are going to get erased and then I'll write a new part to kind of work around. He, he kind of, you know, does his part and then I'll just redo my stuff to work around him. Uh, and you know, I'll have, if I'm demoing these days, I'll have a drum idea, but you know, Randy's going to do what Randy's going to do. So I'll, you know, it's, it's more a serving suggestion and then they all improve on it and make it their own. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, with Toad, everybody's got such an individual style that it always ends up sounding like the band. So, um, you know, and when Todd writes a song or Todd and Dean work on something, they've demoed everything up. And sometimes I'm really just mostly adding a lyric, maybe a bridge, uh, sometimes a whole melody, but really depends on the song. So in a way, it's almost easier because you've got this pool of talent that you know is going to bring a lot to the table. And it's not really on you to come up with all the cleverness in that sense. Yeah, well, we have our strengths and our weaknesses as a group. I mean, and there's there's just a way, you know, nobody's a shredder. Nobody's a session guy. It's like everybody really, you know, Dean, our bass player, is probably the most facile. He's the one guy who can pick up any instrument and kind of grab a style and do something appropriate. Everybody else in the band myself included, we kind of sound like we sound, <laughs> and uh, which is a great thing because, I mean, it, it, you know, session players can't do what Todd does. Like, he has this really beautiful, elegant, open, melodic tone that um, is really hard to cop. Like, he only sounds like him. And so, um, so it kind of means that Toad's going to sound like Toad. You know, no matter what, if you get those harmonies and those players, it really takes care of itself. Um, so that's really easy. It's more of a difficult for me with solo, dif difficult thing for me in solo records to know what I sound like. Like I don't have this thing like James Blake where I have like a signature sound. I just write these songs and every time I go in the studio, it's different. And I think people really like having an artist have a sound that's sure. consistent and I haven't really provided that on my albums. It seems to be working out okay. <laughs> it does. Well, and the other thing is I, I think that people can, uh, even if you don't feel like you have a super unique voice in that sense, they're probably just gravitating to your songs. You know, that, I mean, maybe the songs are... Yeah, but the, no, the songs are there, but there's, there's a hybrid thing. I mean, because you think of Iron and Wine, Gregory Allen, Isakoff, I mean, both on the mellow thing. I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, James Blake is another one. They're like, they have these, there's signature elements to their writing. And the writing is, you know, without the writing, it, it wouldn't hold together. But they all have kind of a core aesthetic, like a larger manifesto about what... I, I mean, it's the strange thing in being a solo artist. Like, a band is is a project. It's self-limiting because of the players. As a solo artist, when it's your name on it and not, you know, I'm not Golden Toe or who knows what, uh, you know, I call myself my name. And so I don't know who I am. I don't want to say I'm just one thing. And I think there's something about deciding that even if the name of the project is the name you were born with, you it does help to kind of limit your aesthetic and give yourself some rules about what you are and what you aren't, uh, just so that you can make cohesive pieces. Uh, and I mean, I think there's an energy 
and once again, the, the album is this odd artifact of technology, right? You know, you could fit whatever, 45 minutes of music comfortably onto a 12 inch 33 RPM disc. So the album was born. It's not like, uh, it's not the proper serving size what, for music. It's just a convenient convention. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's an arbitrary thing. So I think 35 to 40 minutes of music at a time just sort of became the accepted thing once the mm -hmm. LP established itself, right? And so people kind of tend to expect that. Yeah, but in the same way, like, uh, let's say an artist is filling a gallery. Uh, maybe they've gone through a few major, you know, it's like a blue period, a cat period, whatever. They've done these things. And then you go, okay, how many walls do I have in the gallery? If I'm filling the whole gallery, do I have multiple rooms? And then can I do one group of paintings that can be perceived as a collection or a period in that room? And even if you're only attributing, like, you know, painters will go through this period where they're just, you know, it's aloe plants or whatever, and they're just getting deep into that. Right, right. Well, and then they get into another thing, and you fill a different room in each gallery with that or a different wall. And you do try to kind of actually create this context, right, where there's where you're able to view these things against each other and not view them as a tossed salad, <laughs> you know? And I think the album provides a similar forum for that, where you go, there's a similarity between these. Like these days, do you think that the idea of, hey, an album is, you know, 10 songs, whatever, you know, are established sizes. Do you think that's just an, an anachronism at this point, especially because you can release two songs on iTunes or you could release 50 songs in a set if you wanted to. I mean, even your mm -hmm. example of the art gallery, to a degree, I think parallels with the LP in the sense that like if you go to the trouble of going to an art museum, you get dressed, mm -hmm. you get a ride, you go downtown, you pay X amount of money to get in the museum, you're going to be really mad if there's, you know, if there's one painting and it's this big. You have an expectation. And also you're going to get really mad if there's 50,000 square feet of art because you could never cover it, you'd, you know, you'd be exhausted. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, like music consumption has really no rules like that other than what you're charging yeah. for it, especially if you're only buying it one at a time. So, like, I guess what I'm saying is doing a, a four-song EP as opposed to doing a, you know, 50-song set, it's all out the window these days. Everything is the out. Only thing that's, <laughs> the only thing that remains is sort of the specter of the idea of, like, especially the guys like us who are not 17, like, okay, I expect this thing equivalent to an album. Yeah, well... Uh, I think it's a totally reasonable serving size. I mean, you know, you you look at the novel, right, as opposed to the short story. You write differently for a novel than you do for a short story. And there's limits on how many pages people really want to read, right? Uh, I mean, you know, a novel, it's like, what, 300, 2,000 pages, 1,000 feels long, 600, you know, it's what it's pretty wide range, actually. Um, there's something about 10 songs where I feel like you can both go deeply into a period of time and an aesthetic and you can also, uh, yeah, limit it. It doesn't have to. In a way, it seems like these days, you know, the positive of it, of it is that like you're doing a 10 song record and 10 good songs that you really are behind and you know is a quality thing but back in the heyday of the record industry like say you know 70s 80s there were tons of records out there that had two good songs on them and a bunch of filler because that was what they had that was the format they needed to sell i mean even bands that i love my like some of my favorite bands i can pick a records of theirs there's two or three great songs that i love and i go yeah you can tell that was just yeah they were yeah it all depends <laughs> i mean and you know the with swallowed by the new it's like i did this album and i had um feel like an intent for the album in a way that I hadn't always before. I mean, I'd done side projects, but I don't think I'd done a solo album where I really um, understood my material, knew what I needed to address as far as topics, uh, you know, even to the point where there's a song on the album, Grief and Praise, that was written, you know, three days into the studio. I had, you know, this was an album that came out of a year where I, you know, two of my kids went away to college. I got divorced. I got, you know, it was like kind of major changes, you know, the end of a 25 year relationship and kind of the end of, um, yeah, you know, entire period of my life, an entire definition of myself. So 
going into um, the writing process, I knew there were things that I really wanted to say that were very important to the project. And as I was recording it, you know, it was like nagging me that I didn't, that I hadn't said these specific things. And like the last song on the album was definitely uh, not exactly wrap, wrapping it up in a ribbon, but it was uh, making sure I was complete and I had, uh, you know, achieved what I was intending to achieve with it. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's really good to have that intent, you know, uh, to have an idea of why you're doing this of what you want to say. Uh, and especially as I get older, I think when I was young, there was just kind of, it's all play and you have the fire of youth and the ego and you haven't been shot down too many times. So you think everything you come up with is awesome. And so, uh, you know, it's easy to just like write a whole bunch of stuff and think it's all great. Uh, and now at this age, I got to go, oh, God, is this worth it? Is this worth the inevitable heartache? <laughs> so, um, so I put a lot more thought into what I put out. Uh, it's a different thing. Uh, in, in a way, though, I mean, it, there's a couple ways to look at that. In a way, like in, in your position, you sort of established yourself as somebody, you know, who, who is a, a talented writer, a legit guy. And, you know, so I think people are going to regard what you do with some more authority or wisdom. So in a way, you're not under the same scrutiny you were when you were younger. You just didn't realize it then. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's two ways to that. I think there's, if you have nothing, then uh, you can try anything creatively because you have nothing to lose. If you're doing really, really well and people are convinced of your worth, you can take a great experiment and even fail, right? Neil Young did Tron. It was not a good album. Like <laughs> Trans. Trans, and I sorry. On vinyl, downstairs. But it's you the can best do. record. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you love synthesizers, you love that record. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, what about Wild Things Run Fast by Joni Mitchell? Not her greatest moment. <laughs> anyway. It's interesting, the Neil Young thing, though. He turned right around and did, I think the next record was Everybody's Rockin'. It was like a full-on 50s doo-wop kind of thing. So yeah. obviously he felt the need to switch gears. Get it back. Yeah. I'm sorry, I insulted trans. I think you can. No, I know what you mean, of course. No, I mean you can do, you can do these incredible risks and kind of recover it from it if you're falling from a high enough place, right? And it's in this middle class area where you feel like you could lose everything instantly if you make one wrong move. Like you're not, and and that's an internal stance. But I think I've spent a lot of my career, solo career, in fear. Feeling like I can't make a mistake. You, I guess this sort of leads me into some of the other things I want to talk about. I mean, yeah. things have really changed in the sense that, like, you know, you're given a much, you're given a lot, you used to be given a lot more rope. Um, you know, Neil Young could do that back then and get away with that. And these days, I mean, if you made a record, and I'm not saying I know for sure, but if you made a record where every song was like a vocoder and sounded like a robot, you'd probably alienate a lot of people, not me. But. Well, I did it, but I called it Remote Tree Children. I didn't call it Glenn Phillips. Was there a vocoder on every single song? There wasn't a vocoder on everything. We called him Bruno. There's a lot of songs that I sang falsetto, and then we took him down an octave in Maladine and kind of oh, messed really? with the performance. Yeah, I need to hear this. On that album, yeah, I did. Uh, there was a lot of ridiculous listen, you know, odd manipulation and... Uh, so, but I, yeah, I don't know if I'd call that Glenn Phillips. The great thing now is you can use, you know, TuneCore or DistroKid or whatever, make an album, throw it up on the net for nothing, throw it on iTunes and it's available. I mean, and you can record any kind of record you want, right? The, a lot of the, the creative, the barriers of the tools have mostly been removed. So now the barriers are creative. I mean, my case is particular. It's not applicable to a lot of people. It's like there's also, I had years where I made my living making music and I had a family of five in Santa Barbara to support. And so I toured my butt off and I was, you know, feeling the recession and feeling, and right now, you know, my overhead is a little less, uh, you know, this year when I put out, I haven't taken out a band for a solo record since 2004. So it's been over 10 years since I've taken out a band because I haven't been able to afford one. And 
like when I go out in the new year, I'm going to take a band out because I don't have to make as much because I don't have as many mouths to feed. And I mean, it's actually, it's like a, uh, you know, being out of survival mode uh, really changes, you know, it's like as a professional musician, it changes my creative overhead. I mean, it's a funny thing how many people who have another job, like the dream of what it means to be a musician um, is, you know, oh God, I could just do what I love for a living. And the problem with doing what you love for a living is that when it's not going well commercially, it affects the thing you love and you no longer have music to escape to. The great thing about having a day job and making music is music is always there for you. You can always dream into it and you can always love it kind of no matter how bad your job gets, you go home and you make music, <laughs> which is a beautiful thing to do. And if your job is music, when you go home, you've actually lost your escape valve. And, uh, yeah, it can be, can be hard. Wait just a second. My phone is decline. Uh, so it, it's interesting to have got back to the point. Like I finally just in this last year of kind of, you know, getting over separation, getting over life changes and being back in a place where I'm excited about my life again, I suddenly realized I have creative options again for what feels like the first time in a long time. And it's, it's really exhilarating to realize I can do a bunch of like crazy projects that don't have to make any money and just have fun creatively again, which I didn't allow myself for Do you a think long that's time. mainly just because, I mean, besides the fact that you don't have to support your family, um, in addition to that, do you think it's because these days, because of technology and having your own recording setup, that kind of thing, you know, making a, a record isn't going to be a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. It's just something you can do essentially for next to nothing. Yeah, it's all in there. And I mean, I made this solo record. I made it with Paul Bryan, who's a great producer. He produces Amy Mann, Grantley Phillips. I mean, he's he's super talented guy um, and had those players in. But I've made a fair number of records. You know, I, it's this era where I had to learn how to record. I had to learn how to mix. I had to learn how to produce and fake other stuff. And I actually am really grateful for all those lessons. Um, I mean, I remember... You know, engineers, like when Pro Tools started happening, Gavin McKillop, who'd recorded uh, the Toad records at the very beginning, you know, engineers used to hire a Pro Tools guy, right? They're, they did engineering. That was about microphone placement and mixing and, you know, all these arcane arts of sound. And there were a few years where all the old school engineers, there's still budgets. They all had Pro Tools guy and they all eventually learned how to use Pro Tools and you know, so it's changed a lot, but, um, I like knowing that I can make a record completely by myself. If I want to, I can bring in as many people as I can afford or collaborate with. Uh, and it's, you know, there's no longer a barrier to, um, to creating whatever it is you want to create. You, you get to make a whole bunch of decisions about it. So which leads me to my next heavy question. Yeah, I'm sure you've pondered. There used to be this uh, this arbitrary wall that existed for making professional sounding or real releases because you had to be in a big studio, which is cost prohibitive for most people unless you had a record deal. So now, you know, just about anybody who owns a laptop can get, you know, has the tools to make make music. Mm -hmm. and you're seeing that because obviously there's much more music being made. So do you think that the fact that there's so many more people can do it, the, now that there's not really a, much of a filter, that there's just this huge onslaught of music? <laughs> there is a really lot. Anything to filter out the amateurs from the pros? Well, it's hard to say. And like the amateurs versus the pros, I mean, when you were talking about barriers, I mean, I think of Daniel Johnson, right? And all those crazy weird cassette records he made, you know, four track records or, uh, you know, guided by voices who did this really crazy low fi star for then the big, the big album was airplane over the sea by uh, neutral milk hotel. You know, this is one of the biggest, most seminal indie albums ever that was, you know, super lo fi track record. I mean, it's a great record, but, um, you know, the indie world's been playing this hi-fi, lo-fi thing for a long time. And, uh, 
there's a lot of ways to achieve those effects, you know, digitally or not. Anyone can get a halfway decent mic. Like it's the crazy thing about recording gear now is you, I think you have to work to make a really bad sounding audio interface. Like you can picture in the same way, like the free glasses that are, you know, it's like when you go to get your frames, they always say free frame. And you know, it's like the free ones, somebody is designing those to be ugly so that you actually have to buy a pair. <laughs> um, I feel like you almost have to try to make a bottom of the barrel, bad sounding interface right now. The technology is so good. Um, and so, yeah, it's opened it up and I don't really consider it a, the difference between pro or amateur. I mean, art is art and you can make primitive art on, uh, you know, the most rudimentary system. Uh, you know, that anyone can have a recorder now of some kind to put their rudimentary art down. I mean, that's done with. And so anyone can make a record. And, and then the question, yeah, the intriguing question to me is how do we then filter all this content being generated? Uh, what fills, you know, the, the function that the record companies played, aside from distribution and promotion, was they served as a filter. They tried to find stuff that was innovative and interesting and good, which is how we found bands like Guided by Voices. Even, you know, it's like they could record in whatever crappy way they wanted to record, but somebody valued them enough to push them to the front of the line so you could actually find their songs. And so that to me is this intriguing question with all the music on iTunes, with all the music on Bandcamp, with all the music out there and available. Uh, you know, and everybody competitively on reverb trying to get to the top of their genre chart. Like, how do you actually get that music out to people? Um, and when, you know, people have asked me for, you know, advice on their starting their singer songwriter careers. And I usually tell them to study physics and invent a time machine and go back to the 90s when record companies would promote new bands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you think that, uh, and again, this is, I, I don't mean to impose my will of how I think about this stuff, yeah. but um, do you think that what you've just described is having the net effect of turning music creation into more of a, a hobbyist, for lack of a better word, a thing that people do for fun as opposed to a career? It really depends. Uh, I think different, different periods of music reward different talents. And I, cause I mean, I had to really reckon when, when Toad got dropped, I mean, I considered myself doing really well at what I did and it's because I was awesome. Right. I, you know, as a kid, it was the first thing I tried and it did really well. And so I made some awful conclusions about how life worked. <laughs> well, it and might so, have not been awful at the time. Well, no, it was great at the time. And then the band broke up and I couldn't get a record deal and I took it really personally. And, you know, the, the record companies were getting smaller and they weren't signing stuff. You know, I didn't have the brand name toad had the brand name and so i wasn't worth anything and and it was a huge blow to my ego to suddenly be i thought as good as a musician as i ever was and i couldn't get a record deal i mean it was i and then i spent a bunch of years twisting around in depression about that right so um it and the way i thought about it more and more is i mean there's always there, there are these technological innovations or societal changes that like bring about either different types of music, different kinds of revolution. You know, rock and roll was a revolution. Jazz was a revolution. Um, there are all these, you know, recorded music was a revolution. And going from the Edison cylinder to, uh, you know, the LP and that that was something that people could actually afford. Like everybody... You know, most people could actually afford at some point to have a record player. That was huge. The cassette player changed it again. The Walkman changed it. The, you know, the CD. And now we're in this, like, you can have every song ever made basically in your pocket accessible. I mean, so there are these wild changes in technology. And, you know, it used to be to have a hit single. It's like your publisher would take a a road show and they would sell the sheet music and people would take it back to their parlors and play it. Right. right. Like that was a hit. And so, you know, my friend, Dan Wilson, he's a, like a great writer. He was getting really into gay nineties music, like meaning 18, 1890s and like this turn of the century pop music. 
you know, just stacks and stacks of this incredible sheet music where nobody had these recorded songs. And it was the hits of the day. And they're like brilliant songs. And so, um, and back then, even in the writing, you had to write songs that were not only fun to hear, but easy to learn and fun to play, right? Yeah, that was actually what it, yeah, yeah, it's what it took to write a hit song is you needed Aunt Sally to be able to sight read it and make the writer look good, right? You don't have to do that anymore. And so um, it's this really different criteria. And right now, I think you have to be a good musician, but the things that leap you forward are a certain ability to tenacious, you know, depending on the genre you're doing to tour relentlessly, uh, if you're a touring type act and build a live thing and to be a digital native, to promote in a way that feels honest. I mean, it's not just enough, like people keep trying to give me seminars on, you know, how to promote myself better online. I'm not a digital native. I am never going to be at home on Twitter I am never going to tweet. Real, you know, it's and like unfortunately, that's. I think that's just an age problem because some of its age. There's people like Ben Folds is a great Twitter user. Ben Folds is awesome. There are people who are are comfortable with that medium. The thing about digital media is social media is if you're not comfortable on it, that comes across. It's really apparent that you're faking it, and people can smell it, and they don't like it. <laughs> and so. Um, so knowing which social media to use as a person who – like there are all these things that are, are the new things that are rewarded. Your music also has to be good and well-recorded and, you know, or even well-recorded is a question. It has to be recorded in a compelling way. You know, if it's, if it's lo-fi, it has to be compellingly really lo-fi. Well, it's like, yeah, sure. It can't just be uh, distorted digital crap. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's like you need to know – it's just this era rewards different behaviors and those behaviors shift really quickly. Like I think of Colby Calais and her team that broke her on uh, MySpace. MySpace skills are no longer applicable. Uh, now there's YouTube skills and Twitter skills and it depends on your genre. It depends on who, you know, it's like, it's this constant flow of uh, being aware of what's going on and some people can play that and surf that better than others. And so it's a weird era because I feel like it used to be, it's like, well, if it's good music, you put it out, you put it in these magazines, you get it in the stores, you go on tour, you work radio, you know what your genres are and you kind of crank that machine and some stuff works and some doesn't. And now everyone's an outlier, you know, every single success story is a one-off outlier and you can kind of learn from it, but there's no way you can repeat it, which is exciting but it also rewards, I think, certain skill sets and personalities. This, it's not fair or unfair. It's just how it is right now. 